Uh, dear Laureate uh, Justice Albie Sachs, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to welcome you all to the first ever Tang Prize Laureate lecture uh, in the rule of, in rule of law. The Tang Prize in rule of law recognizes persons who have made significant contributions to the rule of law, reflected not only the theory and the practice of rule of law, but also in the actual realization of the rule of law in contemporary societies. Um, I believe that we all share the feeling that the first ever laureate, Albi Sachs, Justice Albi Sachs, is simply the most fitting and excellent choice that exemplifies the aspiration of the rule of law prize set out to achieve. Devoted from an early age in the struggle for freedom, Albi Sachs is no ordinary, not only an ordinary lawyer. He is and has been a lawyer fighting for justice all through his life. Furthermore, he is not only a great advocate, he is an activist and initiator. His solid legal training makes him a most capable crafter and architect. His solid legal training, he, is, uh, he, he acutes sense towards social and human uh, conditions, distills in his profound vision of justice that is noble and at the same time practicable. Uh, these have been reflected in his uh, establishment of the legal structure for the ANC, uh, the African National Congress, while in exile in the designs of the Constitution of South Africa upon, uh, upon liberation as well as in many of his beautiful and elegant written decisions of the Constitutional Court. In the words of the selection committee, Albi Sachs has made significant, significant contributions, that is a quotation, to um, human rights and justice globally, through an understanding of the rule of law in which the dignity of all persons is respected and the strength and values of all communities are embraced. Anyone who listened to Justice Albi Sachs' acceptance speech yesterday would um, no doubt um, be impressed by the distinction between rule of law and rule by law. It is worth uh, recalling that he mentioned this distinction out of deep scholarship setting out to crack the mystery of why and how the legal system in South Africa became one that entrenched racial segregation and discrimination. Justice Sachs devoted his doctoral thesis, later published um, as a justice in South Africa, to careful documenting and tracing the evolution of a, system, of a system gone wrong. But his belief in the rule of law was not diminished even in the darkest days of apartheid. Because he knew that if employed in pursuit of equality, dignity, and justice, the law is an indispensable instrument uh, that protects, that protects, uh, enables, and empowers people. The embodiment of those ideals in South African constitution 
is depicted in his speech yesterday by three fascinating metaphors, freedom, red, and roaches. The law provides a framework and means in dealing with human issues. The struggle never ends. It is fortunate that we may draw inspiration from those who set an example, the one that embodied in, in a truth lawyer uh, as Albi Sachs. We are going to hear an uplifting story, a story of emancipation by means of the rule of law. Ladies and, uh, and, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I give you, you now Albi Sachs. Now that the prize has been awarded, and I assume it cannot be withdrawn, no. <laughs> I'd just like to put a little question mark over one statement made in that very, very eloquent introduction, that L.B. Sachs never lost his belief in the rule of law. And possibly if the selection committee had known about my doubts and uncertainties and at times even anger and rage at the role that law was actually playing. They mightn't have been so enthusiastic, but as I say, I think it's safe for me now. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a confessional story I'm going to give or if it's simply a statement of a journey, but it required several changes before I became totally converted to the rule of law. I had to change, the world had to change, and the rule of law had to change. I'm going to start in the middle of the story and then go back to the beginning. And in the middle, I'm sitting in a very small room, maybe twice the size of this platform that I'm on, jam-packed with people. And you can feel the tension and excitement in that room. And Nelson Mandela stands up. And he says, the last time I stood up in court was to find out if I was going to be hanged. Today, I rise to inaugurate South Africa's first constitutional court. And I was one of the 11 judges sitting behind him, ready to be sworn in. It was a momentous day for us. And we were all particularly thrilled that it was Nelson Mandela the democratically chosen president of South Africa, who was presiding over this occasion of our induction into the court. Some of us had been to prison with him. Some of us had defended him. Some of us had simply read about him. Some of us had simply sat on the bench, but used what little space was available, even under apartheid, as judges, to try and rescue some respect for human dignity. But we all had in common this great enthusiasm for the new constitution and for our new president. And this is where the irony comes in. How did we show our gratitude to Nelson Mandela? Six months later, the Constitutional Court of South Africa struck down and declared invalid two important proclamations 
issued by Nelson Mandela as president of the country. Now that's gratitude for you. He'd appointed us, he'd been 27 years in jail, admired by the whole world, and one of the first decisions of the new constitutional court was to declare unconstitutional a measure adopted by Nelson Mandela on the authority of parliament. It concerned the first democratic local government elections in South Africa. We all voted as equals for the first time in the parliamentary elections. But now we needed a law to deal with elections at the local government level, which is often as important, sometimes even more important than at the national level. And Parliament indicated to the President that it didn't have much parliamentary time to adopt the new legislation. Would he please pass the necessary regulations in a presidential proclamation? And he issued two proclamations. And they dealt with all the things required, the financing, the secrecy of the vote, the counting of the votes. There's little details about how far you have to be from the elections before you can canvass for positions. Practical nuts and bolts of elections. And it was clearly democratic. It was a good law, but we struck it down. And we struck it down because we believed the Constitution required us to strike it down. And why? Because we said, in terms of our new Constitution, the legislative function is given to the legislature. And the legislature cannot abdicate its function by entrusting it even to Nelson Mandela, even to the democratically elected president. And we struck it down. It's quite tricky for this court. With one blow, it struck down the actions of both the other branches of government, the parliament for passing the law and the president for issuing the proclamation. Now, how did we reach that stage? In some sense, the highest expression one can get of the rule of law in our particular country. And what was my journey to get there? And how did I become converted slowly, reluctantly, against much resistance, inner resistance, to a belief in the rule of law? That's the story I'm going to tell today. And I might say my conversion was not simply based on the fact that now I'm a judge and I'm the one who is expressing the interpretation of the law. That was the culmination of a journey. It wasn't the beginning of my conversion. And we start off, I'm a law student at the University of Cape Town. Going to lectures, it's up on the mountainside, the sun's streaming in, excellent professors, and they're speaking about the rule of law and justice and equity. I write it all down. I write the essays, I pass the exams. That's during the day. At night I go down to the poor areas where people are living in shacks. And I'd be asked to conduct study classes. People say eager for knowledge. And there's something special, you're in a little space, corrugated iron, cardboard paper, no lights, the only illumination from candles. And all you see are the eyes and the mouths of people. It brings you so close to the people you're speaking to. And they hated the law. The law for them was the police. The law chased them. The law threatened them. The law locked them up. The law denied them rights. And yet they were willing to give their lives for justice in a way that the professors were not. It wasn't just a beautiful idea as it was for the professors that had served people throughout the ages. It was their passion, their dream. And there was a vitality and an energy and expressivity that captivated me completely and made me feel there's no connection between what I was learning 
up in the law school and writing out in my essays the grand phrases of the ages about the law and law as experienced by the majority of people in my country. The law for them was something that ruled them. At night, if they were out on the streets, a curfew hour would be sounded under the law. They needed a permit to cross the town to be outside of the area where they lived. Day and night, the law said they had to carry a pass, a document, which any policeman could demand of them in their homes, in the streets, without a warrant, without suspicion, show me your pass, that's all. And the passbook contained their right to be in the area they were in, to work for the employer for whom they worked. Their whole life was dominated by that passbook, which was a passbook created under the law. The law said that only white people could own land in 87% of South Africa, which included all the central business districts, the beautiful areas where our homes would be located. The law said the beaches would be reserved, the beautiful, safe, sheltered beaches for white people. The law said that the cinemas were reserved for white people, that buses and trains and even bridges had sections reserved for white people only. This was all done under the law. The law was used to justify bulldozers coming in and knocking down people's homes and forcing them to go to other areas. The law locked them up for not paying their debts. The law was the enemy. Apartheid was managed through the system of law down to the tiniest detail. It was ruled by law. And then I become a lawyer practicing under the system. And I'm torn. I'm torn not simply because it was injustice through law, but that's how I'm trying to defend people within a framework that had elements of decency and justice, where you could secure some space, but at the same time was overwhelmingly oppressive. And in addition, I'm functioning in the law courts during the day and I'm an outlaw at night. The divided self, it's psychologically very punishing to have two lives functioning at the same time. An underground existence that is more real, more significant to you, and an overground public manifestation of yourself. And that was rule by law. And being an advocate, a lawyer, didn't protect me from the repression that formerly had been visited on my clients. And one day I'm about to enter the building that contained my office, my chambers, and I'm placed under arrest without a warrant, without a charge. I'm thrown into solitary confinement under the law. We call it the 90-day law. You could be locked up for 90 days. On suspicion, you might have information about subversive activities at the pleasure of the police officials. And I'm locked up in solitude. And I rage against the law. I rage against my colleagues. How can they permit this, that one of their members about to enter his office is just whipped away like that? And I still remember I would do different things to keep myself occupied, to fight against the isolation, no one to speak to, not knowing what's going on. And I would sing to myself just to hear my voice. And now, for some strange reason, I go around the world singing. I would go through the alphabet always because Charmaine, people who are round and about will remember what the hit tunes were of 1963. And my favorite was always, I'll be living here always, year after year always, in this little cell that I know so well, I'll be living swell always, always, and I'd waltz around and feel amused that this beautiful song to his wife by Irving Berlin 
picked up by Noel Coward, the English playwright, writing about upper middle class manners, that using that song in his play, that that song is keeping alive a little flame of resistance in a freedom fighter in South Africa. I'll be staying in always, keeping up my chin always, not for but an hour, not for but a week, not for 90 days, but always. That's my private little song that somehow kept up my spirits in that time. And 90 days pass, and in terms of the law, I'm released for two minutes. I'm given back my watch, my shoes with the shoelaces. I put on my suit again. I'd been wearing that suit in late winter, and now it's the middle of summer, and I put that suit on again. And before I can reach the street, one of my interrogators comes up to me and says, I'm placing you under arrest. And they take my watch away, and they take my shoelaces away. I'm back in again. All done according to the law. Lawlessness according to law. But something had happened in the meanwhile. And one day the station commander comes in, he's waving a piece of paper, he said, if they'd listened to me, this would never have happened. And I look at the paper and I read, the only book I had was the Bible, nothing else. I read it very, very carefully, two and a half pages a day to ration. I didn't know if I'd be in for years, something more to read. So my eye goes down the page. You know those columns? Two columns and one page. And I can't read across the page. And across the page it says, in the Supreme Court of South Africa, Cape of Good Hope Provincial Division, it is hereby ordered that Albert Louis Sachs be given reading matter and writing material. And suddenly, I don't smile, suddenly the law is the most marvelous thing that ever existed. My colleagues are superb. Your emotions get exaggerated in solitary confinement. So from deep, deep rage, now it's total elation, and I had books I was able to read. I'm sure that saved me. I'm sure I wouldn't be sitting here today if it hadn't been for the books that I got as a result of a court order, even under repressive apartheid. I might say that decision was taken on appeal and the top court in South Africa ruled against it, overturned it, but happily by then I was already out of prison. And two years later, I'm locked up again. Lawyers are supposed to keep their clients out of jail, not go to jail themselves. And this time, the interrogation is more intense. It's sleep deprivation, it's banging the table. Shouting, noise, noise, noise for 10 minutes, total silence for 50 minutes. And that's repeated, they're working in cycles, and eventually I collapse onto the ground and water is poured on me and put up onto the chair again. My eyes are pushed open, I collapse. The same thing happens again. Now that was illegal even under South African law. But who would know about it? If you're kept in solitary confinement, there's no way of testifying, of getting the evidence out, no marks are left. So the very act of locking people up and detaining them without trial became the basis for all the other violations that took place that were unlawful, but it was lawfulness that permitted the unlawful to go uncorrected and undetected. I've never gotten over those experiences. I remember meeting a, an Italian senator who'd been locked up under Mussolini, and he just mentioned to me in passing one day, Albi, you know you never, never get over solitary confinement, and I knew what he meant. There's a kind of internal damage and a sadness that stays with you for life. And yet that aspect was permitted, was permitted under the law and was sanctioned eventually by the highest court in the land, forbidding people to get books when they were locked up like that on the basis that the whole purpose of solitary confinement was to induce the detainee to speak. 
So here were the courts now allying themselves with those who were preventing the freedom struggle from developing and who now were being abused in the way that so many other people were abused with electric shocks, with physical violence, with being hung out of windows and a whole range of things like that because of the inertia of, partly because of the inertia of the judiciary. So I end up, after these experiences in South Africa, with some flickers of hope, but an overall feeling that the law is as capable of oppression as it is capable of promoting freedom. There's nothing intrinsic to law itself that makes it an ally of emancipation and the rights of people. I travel to England. I think, in fact, I can escape from the law. I've done that, been there, done that. That was my first attempt to escape. It failed. I wasn't really good for anything else. I did my PhD, I did the examination of this curious South African judiciary that was so erudite, where you could win small battles, where you could argue intelligently up to a point, and yet at the same time was central to legitimizing a massive system of overt racial discrimination backed up by extremely repressive laws. And you might have thought going to England with a very well entrenched legal system, some of the greatest lawyers in the world, very open society. Now that would be the country that would reinforce my belief and undermine my skepticism about the rule of law. And yet, it almost had the opposite effect. The late 1960s, a period of rebellion in Europe, new critical ideas, critical legal scholarship, at that stage critical criminology, I'm doing social legal studies. It's undermining a lot of that total certainty that people had in the virtue, the rectitude of law. And then I start reading about the person's cases, come across them by accident. I discover that for 60 years, British courts had denied women any rights to vote, to study medicine, to become town councillors, to practice at the bar as a barrister on the basis that they were not persons. The relevant laws said any person who owns property worth so much who's fit and proper, is entitled to register as a voter. So women came forward and asked to be registered, and the court said, no, you are fit and proper, you own property, but you're not a person. I could hardly believe my eyes. Erudite British judges. And then once the president is established, even at the bar afterwards, where it wasn't the statute, it was the lawyers themselves, said, we can't allow you to practice, and we can't allow you to practice, it's for your own protection. We're doing it out of respect for your delicacy. And this was being said by clever, erudite lawyers. And then I read further, and I see the name A. V. Dicey. Dicey? Dicey was the guy who invented the notion of the rule of law, the father of the rule of law. Dicey was a vigorous opponent of women getting the vote. And he said if women got the vote, one of his strongest arguments would be this would be damaging to our empire because our colonial subjects will have no respect for the British Parliament if women have any choice in choosing members of Parliament. So he managed to convey both misogyny 
and imperialist notions in that one project, and yet he was the founder of the rule of law. So I'm undermined in that sense of the automatic virtue in law. I get from him, rule of law means that you have rules laid down that apply equally to everybody, and you have an independent body, a judiciary, that applies those rules. It's the rule of law and not the rule of men. But looking in practice, it's the rule of men, not of persons. And it's the rule of British men and not Indian men or African men. And I'm feeling undermined in terms of respect for the notion of the rule of law. I had wonderful years in the UK. I got a PhD, terrific debates and discussions, which I appreciated. I loved the opportunity to even discover the person's cases, to write a book about them. I had great friends there. But I felt there's so much at the core of British life and maybe coming from a former colony and knowing that to a large extent the whole structure, administrative structure, was established by British colonial rulers in early days and maintained afterwards by British trained judges. It just undermined that sense of certainty about the rule of law. And the next place I go out, I go to Mozambique. It's newly independent. It was exciting. I recovered my courage in Mozambique. They had fought an armed struggle for their liberation. For Lima, the Front for Liberation of Mozambique, had, as the way, the way they put it, united the people, all patriotic people, but especially the poor, the workers, the peasantry, progressive intellectuals, in one anti-racist, progressive, revolutionary force to create the foundations of the new society. I didn't see the rule of law in that presentation. I look at the Constitution. Frelimo is the leading party in terms of the Constitution. And basically the notion is one of people's power. And it's very attractive. It's a new nation wanting to establish itself, to overcome racism, tribalism, regionalism, to unite everybody in a single force to bring about transformation. We shouted the slogans, we sang the songs, we stood in the lines to get our rations. Life was often quite hard, but we felt very energized. And yet, and yet, there's no scope for opposition. Opposition doesn't go away. And in the context of the Cold War, which I might say damaged the African continent as much as slavery and colonialism did. It divided our continent. It led the superpowers to look for strong military leaders on the right or on the left. It was a major, major casualty in Africa was our newly independent states not having the space to develop democratic institutions because all the external encouragement in the context of the Cold War was for strong leadership allying itself with one side or the other in the international conflict. In any event, if there was no scope for opposition, opposition didn't go away. It went underground, it went across the border. South Africa, then Rhodesia, supported the counter struggle. There are millions of people in Mozambique who were forced to become refugees, thousands of people without limbs because of landmines. The destruction was terrible. I learned, if ever I had any doubts about the importance of pluralism in society, space for opposition, 
not from books, not from reading Karl Popper, which I'd read about the open society, just from living through that time in Mozambique. And I also noticed that we, we had no legal system. There were four lawyers left in the country at the time of independence. One was the Minister of Justice, another ran a bank, the other two were law teachers. We had to train young people to be lawyers. It was fantastic. We set up community courts that worked so well, elected by the local community to deal with the divorces, little disputes, the crimes and so on. They worked phenomenally well. And yet and yet, somebody would be locked up, alleged to have been a thief. What could you do? If you knew somebody in authority, you could do something. If you were an important person, you could do something. But if you were poor, if you were nobody, there were no rules, there were no mechanisms, no procedures. For me, that was so vital, learning in practice, how important it is, and for the poor more than for the wealthy. The wealthy can get round these problems, one way and another, honestly and crookedly. They can avoid these problems, but the poor have got no other power. We might have the only resort that can save them from being locked up and waiting for months and months and months to be brought to trial, and then having a proper charge and having a proper defense, they are the ones who need the law. And so I'm finding the roots of the rule of law are becoming planted in my head, in my imagination, quite strongly in Mozambique. And then I get invited by um, Oliver Tambo and the ANC leadership. He's the president of the ANC in exile to come to Lusaka and to help the ANC with certain problems that had arisen. The first one is he phones, African style, very polite. I'm working in Mozambique, asks about my health, about the weather, the political situation in Mozambique, and I'm wondering, what's he getting at? What does he want? And eventually he said, is it possible for me to come to Lusaka? He knows it's very difficult. I'm working hard. If I can't come, he fully understands. But if necessary, he can speak to President Michel to make it possible. Now, the usual ANC communication would be an instruction. Comrade Albi, there's a conference in Greenland next Thursday. You be there with a 30-page paper presented. Here's the president of the organization. If you can, we'll appreciate it. If you can't, we understand. And of course, you want to say, take me, take me, take me. And I turn up a week later in Lusaka, go to his little office. I still remember he had a rolled up newspaper. He was swatting flies and somehow I felt the leader of the liberation movement shouldn't be spending his time swatting flies. And again, this very polite, correct African way of speaking, and eventually he said, we have a problem. We have a number of captives in our hands who've been sent by Pretoria to destroy the organization. ANC now has camps that's living all over Africa and Pretoria is sending people in to destroy the organization. And we don't have any regulations about how they should be dealt with. It must be very difficult. Of course, political parties don't have regulations about how you deal with captured opposing political figures. Uh, in the United States, maybe the Democratic Party would love to have one. What do you do with captured Republicans or vice versa? That's not the normal stuff that you get in a constitution of a political party. And he drafted the ANC constitution when it was a political party without the vote for the people, but proclaiming the vision of a free society in South Africa. And in my confident, lawyer-like way, I say, oh, well, there are international instruments, very clear. No torture, inhuman or degrading punishment or treatment. 
and he says, we use torture with a bleak face. What? We use torture? We're fighting for freedom and we use torture? I'm stunned. He doesn't give me the background, but it turned out that in the camps in Angola, when these agents were caught, the people who were the guards were school children, university students who'd given up their studies to go out and fight for freedom, aged 19, 20, 21. They beat up the captives the same way they'd be beaten up if they were caught in South Africa. That's what you do with captives, you beat them up. And an inquiry was instituted by him and the evidence was clear this was happening. And now he decided we need some kind of regulation. So he asked me, and I can see relief in his face at the approach I'm adopting. And possibly the most important document I've drafted as a lawyer in my life was the Code of Conduct for the ANC, a liberation movement in exile, to deal not only with captured enemy agents, but with the problems created by a member of the organization assaults another member. Sexual assault, physical assault, gets into a fight, stabs, drives a car recklessly, crashes it, steals money. What do you do? How do you deal with them? Our host countries are saying, we've got enough problems. We rely on you to deal with your own problems. So it became, in effect, a code of criminal law and a code of criminal procedure for a liberation movement in exile with structures, with legal defense, with appropriate penalties, with systems of appeal. In the context within which we're working, where we don't have a legal profession, we don't have courts, we don't have prisons, but how can you get the essential elements of basic fairness and yet some form of accountability introduced into the functioning of the organization? The key issue was interrogation. And we had a conference that discussed other matters as well. Little town in Zambia called Kabwe. 250 of us, delegates there. Zambian troops surrounding the building in case commandos came from South Africa to take us all out. And we're discussing a code of conduct and the abolition, the prohibition of torture being used by a liberation movement. And I was asked to make the presentation. And I put to the delegates the issue of, is it possible to use what was called intensive methods of interrogation in extreme conditions? I don't know how they're going to respond. The first person up on the platform was a young soldier under an assumed name. The probabilities are that he died in the struggle. They were very vulnerable. And he said, no torture. And don't use any other euphemism. If you give the slightest scope to security, they'll never stop there. And he was followed by another young guy, also from the military. And he said, we are fighting for life. How can we be against life? For me, that captured everything. That's what united us. That's what kept us together. That was much more powerful as a unifying theme for a national liberation struggle than all the weapons and all the guns that you could possibly imagine. And we put the matter to the vote, and overwhelmingly, the delegates, not overwhelmingly, unanimously, we decided, no torture, full stop, no torture. And I love telling the story in the United States, where they're still discussing whether it's permissible to use torture or not against terrorists. And they've signed the convention, International Convention Against Torture. It's as clear as anything. And where people are arguing, well, we don't have torture because the results of torture are unreliable. They're not so unreliable. Lots of our people were broken by torture. They revealed secrets. You don't have torture because torture is ugly. And it's ugly not only to the people who are being tortured, but to the torturers. And not only to the torturers themselves, but to the society that condones it. It 
poisons, it permeates, it penetrates through. It, it transmits that sense of ugliness to the whole of society. And looking back, this was legality inside our movement. This was, if you like, a form of the rule of law being conceived in our heads, not simply as a useful instrument of government and control, but as something defining who we were, defining what it meant to be a freedom fighter, what we were fighting for, what the nature of our struggle was. It had a profound significance. We didn't even use the phrase rule of law. And it was remarkable to see how well it was taken up by the membership. I wish I could say there was never any example of torture after that. But certainly, if it happened, it was something irregular, rare, and not condoned. But the systemic, systematic abuse of captives certainly stopped. There was a change in terms of the personnel in charge of security. And I believe it's one reason why we have our Bill of Rights in South Africa today, playing such a central role in our society, and a notion of constitutionalism that's not confined simply to electing members of parliament and government, but certain core values of the society, because we had rooted these core values inside ourselves at a time when it mattered the most when it wasn't just doing something to please somebody or to show the world that we are civilized. And not long afterwards, the ANC comes out with a policy of official policy in exile. We want a multi-party democracy in South Africa. And the next year it says, we want an entrenched Bill of Rights. I often get patted on the back by legal people in South Africa for persuading the ANC to adopt a Bill of Rights. It was the other way around. The ANC persuaded me. It was Oliver Tambo, the president of the ANC, who pushed hard for a Bill of Rights. And I remember at one delegates conference that we had, I'm asked to speak about a Bill of Rights and my heart's going boom, 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 boom. A Bill of Rights, some people thought it was a Bill of Whites. A Bill of Rights would be the instrument to protect the whites from any transformation and change. Black people can have the vote, but a Bill of Rights is protecting the property and the power, the privileges to maintain the status quo. And I'm explaining why we need a Bill of Rights in South Africa. And I say, first, it's for tactical reasons. We are being presented as Marxist, Leninist, atheist, any kind of ist that was negative, terrorist, who could never run South Africa. South Africa had to be saved from communism, from terrorism, from all these different isms. And we are standing for a Bill of Rights. It's very important for the public face of the organization. But we've often done things that haven't been popular. When we went in for the armed struggle, we were told by many of our supporters, even our great friends in Norway were unhappy with the armed struggle. But we had to. We had to. When we didn't have the vote, we didn't have other mechanisms of achieving change, it raised the level of commitment of the people struggling for freedom and became an important ingredient, not on its own, but for transforming our society and cracking, undermining apartheid. But Oliver Tambo saw that the Bill of Rights was central to the vision of the new South Africa, where you didn't give special votes and privileges to the whites as whites. You gave protections to human beings as human beings. If they were white or black or brown, it didn't matter. And the protections would be against arbitrary deprivation of your property, against being chucked out of your home, against being denied the vote, freedom of movement, because you were a human being, not because you were white and belonged to a minority that was frightened that the majority would do to the minority what the minority had done to the majority. And strategically, that became the basis, the foundation of our miraculous transformation. Nelson Mandela is rightly placed 
praised for a marvelous role he played as the visible face of the ANC. But he had no part in these basic strategic decisions taken in a completely different context. It's important to stress this point because people looking for transformation change in other countries may be waiting for a Mandela to turn up, simplify the process of history. Thousands and thousands of people took part in many countries in different ways and contributed in different ways. And this was Oliver Tambo's special role, his visionary role, rejecting terrorism, insisting no torture of captives, and then insisting on the vision of a Bill of Rights in a democratic South Africa. And I made that argument to the group and they could accept that. That's not why my heart's going boom, 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 boom. My heart's going boom, 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 boom because of my third reason. I said we need a Bill of Rights against ourselves. And we'd lived in countries where people had fought heroically for freedom, but often the great liberators had turned out to centralize power, to become despotic, to become authoritarian. And we needed to say in advance, we are aware of these possibilities and we need to protect ourselves against ourselves, our nation and our society. So already living in what we call a liberation, a revolutionary liberation movement in exile, we had taken the decision to have a Bill of Rights that entrenched all these fundamental rights. So when it came ultimately to writing our new constitution, we weren't starting from scratch. We were basing it on our own experience, our own dreams of what's possible, our own awareness of our own fallibility. We imprinted that into the new constitutional order. So in a way, ironically, paradoxically, the circumstances that transformed L.B. Sachs into an ardent believer in the rule of law were the harsh circumstances of living and working in countries where the law courts played relatively minimal roles in the kind of situations that, that I've described. That speech I made to the delegates at that little conference, a month later I'm blown up. I was so glad I'd made that speech before I was blown up. And something happened with that bomb. A lot of the sadness that had been deposited in me through the detention, solitary confinement, got blasted away. I'd survived the bomb. That moment every freedom fighter is waiting for, will they come for me today? If they come for me, will I be brave? Will I get through? They'd come for me and I'd survived. I felt elated and I still feel elated. That was 1988. Maybe a psychiatrist can explain what's going on there. And the very first task given to me when I came out of hospital some months later in England by the Constitutional Committee of the ANC was to help draft a Bill of Rights for a democratic South Africa in the name of the ANC. Now when my cousin Ben Rabinovitz saw a film in which this point is made, he kind of gasped. What kind of organization is this? This guy has just come out of a hospital and they give him the task of writing the Bill of Rights because he hadn't been a member of an organization fighting for freedom he couldn't see. This was the best medicine in the whole world. It was worth all the physiotherapists and all the medicines and all the activities and the occupational therapy because it was beginning to concretize a dream, a goal, a vision an imagination. And I remember sitting on the table in the kitchen in Dublin, a blank piece of paper in front of me, no books. A Bill of Rights should proclaim itself. It should come out from your innermost sense of justice and fairness. It's not something where you have to read up. It's what every human being is basically entitled to. And I sat down and I jotted down a whole series, and then I looked at the books and the Universal Declaration. It was all there. It was all there. So the Bill of Rights, writing the Bill of Rights for me is part of my healing. And afterwards, coming back to South Africa, Mandela is released, we're now negotiating. It was the constitution writing process itself 
that was enormously healing for me, that divided LB. Do I listen to the law professors up on the hill? Do I listen to the voice of the people who find the law the enemy? Suddenly the beautiful phrases of the ages take on operational significance and meaning. They're not just beautiful phrases. That's what our country needs. There's a reason why these words have survived in different countries, in different continents, different contexts. But also we need the passion of the oppressed, of the multitude. And combine their passion with the grand phrases, that gives you a constitution. And it's that combination of never again, never again, the terrible things done in the name of the law, outside of the law in the past, but also the hope and possibilities and expectations for the future. Perfectibility and corruptibility. These are the two foundations of any constitutional order. And that's why, in a way, one can say it was quoted, I was quoted yesterday as saying, we must always be skeptical of law's pretensions, but never cynical of law's possibilities. And that's been my experience in life as a lawyer and as a human being. And if we'd given up on the possibilities of law, if we'd become either cynical and totally skeptical and abandoned, we wouldn't have the constitution that we have now. And the process of writing that constitution didn't just help heal Albi and connect up the two sides of Albi that seemed to be completely in disjunction. It helped to heal the nation because people who'd been fighting each other literally to the death now were sitting around a table and through dialogue finding means of how can we live together in the same country. And another idea came very strongly to me, the difference between accommodation and compromise. Compromise doesn't work with constitutional arrangements. Accommodation does. Compromise is doing a deal that nobody likes, but just for the sake of getting an agreement. Accommodation means you understand the other and you create space for the other, and they create space for you. It's not just a question of terminology. We found in practice we had to acknowledge the deep fears, the uncertainties, the concerns of the people who'd been our oppressors, and they had to acknowledge the demands and the desires and the concerns of the oppressed and find the language that was appropriate for both. And so in the process of helping to write the Constitution, I found myself emerging as a strong and convinced and powerful pro proponent of the rule of law. Not because of any inherent virtue it might have, but because it had proved itself to be the mechanism, not simply for bringing a kind of order and decency to our country, but creating the very foundations of our country. Our constitution is central. It's more than a basic document. It's constitutive of a South Africa where people are living together as equals with the mechanisms to protect that. When I was lying in hospital recovering from the bomb, mostly I was very chipper and cheerful but at about four in the morning, I would wake up, the painkillers have worn off. I'd feel very alone. And I would sing to myself, for a non-religious person, I find myself often invoking religious music, uh, what we used to call a Negro spiritual. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord. And I'd go through all the different family members, feeling very, very alone. But then I'd sleep again, wake up, cup of tea, and I'd be cheerful right through the day. And one day I get a letter. Then if the older people here, you remember letters, those things with stamps that you would lick? And I'm opening it with my one hand, and I read the note. 
don't worry, comrade Albie, we will avenge you. Signed, Bobby Naidu, who'd been in exile with me. And I'm thinking, avenge me? We're going to cut off the arms, blind in one eye? Is that the kind of country we're looking for? And then I say to myself, if we get freedom in South Africa, if we get democracy, if we get the rule of law, that will be my soft vengeance. And afterwards I heard in Mozambique that caught one of the persons who placed the bomb and I said, if he's put on trial and the evidence is not enough to prove beyond reasonable doubt that he's guilty and he's acquitted, I said, that will be my soft vengeance because then we're living under the rule of law and that's much more important than that one rascal is sent to jail. And I said, roses and lilies will grow out of my arm. And from then onwards, in a sense, my whole life became involved in, if you like, the roses and lilies of freedom, of democracy, of being able to find mechanisms to bring people together and enable former enemies now at least to live side by side, even including meeting the person, Henry was his name, who put the bomb in my car, went to the Truth Commission. And we were speaking, and eventually I ended up after he'd testify to the Truth Commission, he got amnesty, I eventually shook his hand. He's all part and parcel of the transformations in our country. The last time I looked, I didn't see any roses and lilies growing out there. But there's been a flourishing in our country for all the problems that we have, and the problems we've inherited and problems we are still creating, and new problems that we're inventing. We can't put all the blame on the past. But it's been a transformative kind of a process, and the law has been right at the heart, as was so beautifully brought out by uh, the moderator earlier on, of this particular endeavor. Let me just tell you a little bit about the Constitutional Court, the wrap-up part of my presentation. We chose the site of the old Fort Prison to build the permanent building of the Constitutional Court. We chose it for its history. We say with a very dubious pride, we South Africans have the only prison in the world where both Gandhi and Mandela were locked up. No one else could make that claim. And that's where we decided to build our new Constitutional Court, to transform the negativity into positivity to help promote that sense of transformation. Anybody going to the prison will know we're not stuck there. We've got the court. Anybody coming to the court will know why we've got the court and remember the pain of the past, but would end up with a sense of hope. And that powerful energy that had been invested in the bars and in the bricks of negativity, that same energy now becomes an energy for transformation and change. So the very bricks that we used to lock up people are now inside the court building, inside the chamber itself, those same bricks. We had a competition for a new building and the winners produced the theme of justice under a tree, a beautiful building with light and artwork and a sense of warmth and comfort and invitation it's all part of that transformation. And it's all part of what I consider to be the emancipatory elements of the rule of law. We've moved from rule by law to rule of law. But something has to be said about what do we mean by rule of law. Classically, rule of law meant clear rules, equal treatment of everybody in society under those rules, and impartial arbiters, judiciary, to do that. And classically, rule of law has been used to prevent arbitrary detention. One has to support that. To bolster democratic accountability through electoral processes. To support freedom of speech to protect property. It's used very extensively to protect international investment 
from arbitrary seizure and local investment from arbitrary seizure. But sometimes the rule of law is confined simply to that domain. And that's why for the millions of people who don't have property, who might vote but they don't see it making any difference to their lives, who might speak but nobody's listening, the rule of law doesn't reach them. They're being beaten up in their home by their spouse. There's no rule of law. Their love to their loved ones, partners, is not recognized by the law because the person is of the same sex. There's no law that can help them. The law punishes them. They might be asylum seekers, the most desperate people in the world, but they're treated as something alien and poisonous to be kept out. The rule of law mightn't reach them. They might be people who are wanderers, people of a certain religion in certain countries. The rule of law doesn't reach them. And what we found in South Africa was to make the rule of law really entrench in our society, it had to have an expansive and emancipatory quality to it. It wasn't enough simply to have erudite judges and good lawyers and good technical approach to law. The vision of the law had to be an embracing one. It had to reach out to people who traditionally been for one reason or another, marginalized, excluded, kept out. And if it didn't do that, somehow that sense of liberation in South Africa would be incomplete. We found that very, very powerfully when it came to the status of, of women generally and of African women in particular. If we'd simply applied the old fashioned, is there a rule? You apply the rule. The rule taken from customary law is the man is the head of the household, he's the boss, the woman is really like a child in terms of legal rights, but she's represented by the husband or the father or the older brother or the son. We could have done that following traditional rule of law, Dicean approach, but that wouldn't have meant the law being relevant and responsive and emancipatory and meaningful to Mrs. Shabalala, whatever her name might be. If a girl child couldn't inherit because she was a girl and only a boy child could inherit, it meant the law, although there was a rule backing that up, that rule wasn't really the rule of law with that broad vision. And so it became clear to us, and it's in our fundamental principles, foundational principles in our constitution, the rule of law is not on its own. It's one of the four foundational principles of our Constitution expressly put out. And the first one is human dignity and the achievement of equality and the promotion of human rights. That's number one. The second is the rule of law and the supremacy of the Constitution. The third is a non-racial and non-sexist society. And the fourth is a democratic society, I'm not quoting exactly, based on regular elections with voters on a common voters' roll to create a government that is accountable and sensitive to the needs of the people. And that summary in the foundational principles in our constitution summarizes, to my mind, the emancipatory vision of the rule of law. Without the rule of law, the other features are extremely vulnerable and very fragile. So it is an essential ingredient of a modern democratic society with the basic value system that we have. But the rule of law on its own, without being infused with the values of supporting human dignity and non-racialism and non-sexism and advancing human rights and achieving equality becomes a sterile document that can actually be used to impede the achievement of rights and become a form of rule by law, legitimizing inequality, legitimizing injustice because it's done through the law. I think all societies have to acknowledge this tension between the skepticism and the idealism 
and we had many cases in our court where we had to make pronouncements where we feel we got the appropriate balance right. It wasn't just solving disputes, it was telling a story about the nature of our society, about who we were, what it meant to be a South African in a free South Africa. It was holding up a kind of an example, exemplary vision and notion, not only of how to solve the dispute between A and B, but how we expect conduct to be evaluated, especially conduct of those in authority and power. It was a narrative in that sense of, of the new nation through the legal disputes being tested and evaluated by the judges. We said that prisoners would have the right to vote. We abolished capital punishment. We said that patriarchy as a central feature of traditional law was incompatible with the values of our new society to the extent that it limited the rights of women to inherit property, to get an equal share in the family estate, and to have the dignity that went, the independence that went with the position of an equal inside marriage, outside marriage in our society. We held that if the community wanted a woman to be the chief, even if the old rules said only men could be chiefs, even if the old rules said you are born a chief, you cannot be chosen to be a chief, we said customary law evolves, it's changed. It's evolving, developing customary law this was all in keeping with the notion of the rule of law as being responsive to the needs of the people, the evolving values of the people, the emancipatory vision of the rule of law. I hope, Mr. Judicator, uh, nothing I've said causes you to feel you made a wrong choice. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, I think candor is an important quality in law that's often ignored. But just the thinking that was produced in my mind about getting this prize compelled me to go back, compelled me to revisit this long journey, compelled me to reflect on the skepticism, which I don't deny. I think that skepticism has to be there all the time. And we have to be skeptical even about our own achievements, not to become overindulgent and satisfied and re-examine. And fortunately in South Africa, we have brilliant critics. It's very hard when you're a judge to read trenchant criticism. In fact, the better the criticism, the harder it is of judgments that you've issued. But it's part of the vitality, the vitality of, of our nation and of our jurisprudence. And so, Ultimately, when it came to a decision about accepting the prize, it was so generously offered. Uh, the spirit of it is, is so gracious and encouraging. And the idea of exalting certain values as being important in relation to justice, I just felt very honored, very, very proud to have found my life story in a way as being sufficient to, to inspire the judges. Uh, but I feel for that story to be understood, the doubts and the vacillations and the uncertainties are as important as the final conviction and the final determination that the rule of law is meaningful, that its content and significance in any society depends on us, on the people, on the lawyers, on the judges, on the litigants, on the legal profession, on the critics, but on the whole of society. The rule of law doesn't automatically mean fairness and justice. Without the rule of law, you're unlikely to get fairness and justice. But the quality of the justice, the quality of the fairness, will depend upon the inputs that the legal system requires from those who are functioning within it and from those outside. So everybody here, the law students or non-law students, don't just sit back and say, it's great, you've got the rule of law. Think about what you can do to contribute to making the rule of law meaningful and relevant and significant for Taiwan as we did for us in South Africa. Thank you.
Thank you, Justice O.B. Sachs, for the very touching speech. Let's again welcome Professor of Gordian University, Dr. Stark, to give us an ending remark. Many thanks, Justice Orby Sachs, for your impressive, profound, and uh, very, very um, uh, interesting lecture about your personal fighting for justice. You were, for a long time of your life, a fighter for justice, and then you had the, your opportunity, the opportunity to be 15 years judge. Judge on the basis of a constitution which realized the rule of law. And I think I have, I'm Professor von Göttingen, you, you know now, all, now and therefore I have prepared a quotation of a very famous professor of Göttingen in the 19th century, uh, Rudolf von Jering, about law. Uh, the, the title of this, uh, that is not a real book, that is a, a lecture, a, a, pre, uh, a, a printed lecture, and the title is um, uh, Der Kampf ums Recht. Uh, that means struggle for law, the struggle for law. And I give, new, I give you a quotation uh, uh, translated into English. The end of the law is peace. The means to that end is struggle. Mm -hmm. You report it, <laughs> your personal life. That fits very good for your personal life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now the, the further sentence, every principle of law which obtains had first to be wrung by force from those who denied it. And every legal right supposes a, con a, a continual readiness to assert it and defend it. The law is not mere theory, but living force. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very, uh, Rudolf von Jahring didn't know your, his, your history, but I think that, that fits very well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The emancipation of South African people from a repression to freedom the establishment of a homegrown constitutional order, one that suits the local, social, and human conditions, will have a long-lasting influence to our understanding, and not only of the understanding of in your country, but we know this situation in South Africa and the de development all over the world. And that's very interesting that you, uh, that you uh, framed the constitution and this constitution is an impressive uh, application of the rule of law. And uh, the court, the constitutional court, has a, has a task to uh, safeguard it. Yes. We are truly fortunate to be uh, able to hear from you a powerful portrayal of the emancipa emancipatorious vision. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, I think we shall uh, thank Justice, uh, Justice Sachs once more, and I think you will join my clap. Many thanks to Professor Stark and Justice Albee Sachs. You inspired us so much.